gentlemen, one of the major issues with World War II shooters is the lack of variety. You played one World War II shooter and you've played them all. Really, the major difference between World War II shooters is the levels of realism. Now, Medal of Honor Aeroborn, on the other hand, tries and succeeds in doing something different. But before we get to the game proper, let's first take a look at its development. The development for Medal of Honor Airborne began in 2004, and the developers wanted to really revolutionize the Medal of Honor scene. And for them, simply adding a dog wasn't nearly enough. Instead, the idea of playing as a paratrooper came up during a design session, and the game was built from there. The developers wanted the game to be as non-linear as possible, and they wanted each drop to be able to be played in a different way each time one played it. The lead designer for the game was Rex Dixon, a suggestive name if ever there was one, and the executive producer was Patrick Gilmore. Gilmore had previously worked on the groundbreaking Medal of Honor Allied Assault, so there was already a good pedigree behind the game. As with any game, some things were cut during development. Originally, there was to have been some pathfinding missions, and these would have focused upon stealth. This was cut due to the actions of everyone's favorite company, Electronic Arts, as they wanted to focus on simple, large-scale fights. Honestly, I can live without those stealth missions. First-person stealth is very difficult to get right, and there's always a good chance these stealth missions could have turned out to be the absolute weakest part of the game. Awesomely enough, the game was developed with close cooperation with the community. The devs actually paid attention to forum posts and ran online summits. They even invited some Medal of Honor fan site leaders to test the multiplayer, and then apparently the devs actually listened to said fan site leaders. And strangely enough, most of the game-breaking bugs were fixed prior to the release, and others were fixed by Patch 1. Hmm, no wonder this game from 10 years ago still works, while other modern games do not. So with that, let's pop a ZF-41 scope on our STG-44 and jump feet first into hell. Medal of Honor Airborne is a first-person shooter of the highest caliber in that you do not have regenerative health. Sure, regenerative health can work in Call of Duty most of the time, but Medal of Honor is meant to be a much slower game that favors taking cover and being methodical. So what you have for health is the interim type. It is not full-on health packs, but it's not full-on regenerative health either. This was a popular health model in the 2007 through 2009 era, and was used just before the COD monster fully devoured FPS games. Interim health works thusly. You have four health slots. Once they are all depleted, you die. Each health slot can be depleted in only a few hits, and they will be gone until you pick up a health pack. However, if you get to cover fast enough, a health slot that has not been fully lost due to damage will regenerate. This health system works well enough and ensures that the player just doesn't run face first into the bullets. The game is fairly generous with health packs, but you still need to keep to cover and not just run and gun. Thankfully, this game was actually on the tail end of FPS innovation and thus actually tries to introduce some new concepts. Whatever next! Its main innovation was its cover system that was sadly never seen again in the first person shooter genre. If you hold down on the right mouse button, you aim down sights, but you cannot move. But you can lean left or right, and if you are crouched behind a chest-high wall, you can pop up and down by using the forward and back keys. This cover system works excellently, and it's much smoother than just about any other system, and I have no idea why no other FPS used it. The game does not have a two-weapon rule. Rather, it was one of those rare breed of FPS that used the three-weapon rule, where you have an infinite ammo pistol and two long guns. This works well enough, and as we will see soon, you only really need two weapons anyway. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, it is... Weapon review time. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, the way the weapons work is nothing short of brilliant. No, no, that's not quite strong enough. It's beyond brilliant. It's brilliant! That's French for brilliant, you know. There are so many cool guns to choose from, but since the devs chose to go beyond the mundane, they have given us a weapon upgrade system. Not the boring kind where you allot points or things of that nature. Rather, as you use a certain weapon, you can level it up. So you have the Thompson submachine gun here. At first, it's just a basic one with a 30 round mag. Well, as you unlock upgrades, you get a forward grip that is truly high speed low drag and a cut compensator and a 50 round drum. 
yeah, this is not historically accurate, and yeah, the upgrades just appear out of nowhere, but it is seriously bloody well fun. And that is what the devs were going for in this game. They wanted to go beyond simply having the basic M1 Thompson in 1911, and they gave the player more reasons to use certain weapons. And it is indeed an acceptable break from reality. And it is definitely one that I would have loved to see other developers use. Another acceptable break from reality is the fact that you cannot just pick up ammo off the ground. Like in Medal of Honor Allied Assault, you have to find random ammo boxes scattered about, and they will have rifle ammo, machine gun ammo, and automatic rifle ammo. This ensures that one actually aims and conserves ammo. You start the game with the M1 Grand, the Thompson submachine gun, and the 1911A1. These are great starting guns because they are both semi and full auto, and do good damage all around. The M1 cannot be reloaded in the middle of a clip, and is a very good gun for picking off distant targets. And the Thompson is a good starting SMG, but ammo gets a bit scarce. The 1911A1 is a decent weapon, but in this game, pistols are not at all useful, and you will likely never use it unless you panic while switching weapons. You then have the initial Axis weapons, the Carabiner 98 Kurtz. It's good for long-range rifle fire, but is inferior to the M1. And then you got the MP40. Like in other World War II games, it is a good go-to gun, and when upgraded, it's a beast as it can field a 64-round magazine juggle-taped to another magazine, and is better in many respects to the Thompson in this regard. Next, we have the Springfield Sniper Rifle. It's decent enough for its stated purpose, but I never used it much, because you can get the Gewehr 43, a semi-auto rifle that can be upgraded with a 20-round magazine and a scope. Once you have this rifle, out goes the M1 and the Springfield. Then there's the Winchester Shotgun. This is another gun I never really used. In some circumstances it works well, but most of the time you will want a longer ranged weapon. Next, you have the Browning Automatic Rifle. It's another decent weapon, but it is not appreciably better than the G43, so I never used it all that much either. Next, you have the old win the game gun, the STG-44, the Sturmgewitter. It shows up in the third level and will round out your weapon selection. It has amazing ammo capacity and range and stopping power, but it's even more OP than that, lads and lasses. You can upgrade it with jungle taped magazines and a scope. And at that point, it outclasses every weapon in the game, with only the G-43 even approaching it in greatness. So like in real life, the Germans have the best weapons, and it's best to use them accordingly. The last two weapons of the game are really not used much. You have the Recolis Rifle, that was actually a post-war weapon, but it's cool to see it in the game, since using the same old Panzerfaust, again and again, gets old. The Panzer Shrek returns, and is like it always is. Then there is the special unlockable pistol, the Broom Handle Mauser. Sadly, this, like the 1911, is pretty much useless in this game. Mainly because, once again, you're fighting rifle-armed enemies and you're trying to use a pistol on them. Now, you can get some upgrades for it, such as a burst fire and a stock, but really, by the time you unlock this gun initially, you're already going to have the Sturmgewehr, so why would you go to a pistol when you have that particular rifle? Now, I'm not really complaining all that much, mainly because it is very rare that we actually get this pistol in a game. You then have your grenades. They come in both pineapple and stick varieties, but they're handled differently. Unlike in COD, where you can just quick toss a grin, in this game, you have to hold down the fire button and then throw. Having played a bunch of COD games recently, I blew myself up the first time I threw a grenade. This grenade system is still good though, and since you are fighting in more varied terrain, the ability to control the toss is needed. When you start each mission, you are allowed to choose the guns you want to use. This is yet another element of non-linearity that this game promotes. Really though, you're going to want to stick with the SGG-44 and the Gewehr-43 most of the game. The weapons are badass, and so too are the enemies. The main issue with most World War II shooters is the lack of a difficulty curve. When you fight one member of the here, you have fought them all. Not so in this game though. Hell, your first enemies don't even belong to the here. Rather, you fight Italian black shirts, and they put up a decent fight, but when the here shows up, they are indeed tougher than the black shirts. As in physically tougher, as in they actually take a few more bullets to put down. 
Sure, that's not realistic, but it sure is fun. And as you go through the game, there will be different levels of German troops. You, of course, also end up fighting the Fallschirmjäger as well, which is only fitting seeing as how you're a member of the Airborne. And one of the more cool aspects of the game is the fact that the Germans will be armed with a different level of weaponry as you go throughout the game. And eventually, not a single German troop will be armed with a Carabiner 98 Kurtz. The very last German troop you fight is so ahistorical, it's not even funny. But they certainly are fun to fight. The Storm Elite, ladies and gentlemen, is a gas-masked, although why he has that on, I don't know, MG-42 armed beast. He takes numerous shots to put down and rips through health and friendly bots with impunity. The game gets many of the troop names right, and they actually call the German army the Heer. But for the Storm Elite, they are referred to as the Nazi Storm Elite, implying that they are a member of the actual Nazi party. So I can assume that they are SS men so filled with meth, coke, and propaganda that they don't even feel the bullets. It's awesome to actually give the player some challenge, as this is a video-based game and not a documentary. The enemy AI is fairly good, and they will fill you with lead if you are not careful, and they will flank you if you are not attentive. And if they flank you, they love to run up to you and beat the shit out of you. There is one level that is filled with bloody snipers that will leave you yelling fuck and shit in several second intervals. The weapons are epic, and the enemies are cool, but that's not all the game has to offer. Since this is Medal of Honor Airborne, you of course jump out of a perfectly good airplane and can land just about anywhere you want to on the map. And the devs encourage you to jump to different locations, as there are hard to reach jump areas called challenge drops. These will be hard to spot during a first playthrough, but they are fun to find and achieve. The game also features different types of landings as well. You have the fairly common botched landing where you face plant right into the ground, and then the slightly more doable greased landing where you don't face plant and get into the action quicker. The objectives for the game are fairly standard. Shoot certain enemies, turn valves, and blow things up. The game gives you massive levels to fight through and never holds your hand, and lets you the player determine which objective you want to complete. The game's level design is nothing short of amazing. They really did intend for you to land just about anywhere and everywhere, and there are numerous paths and alternate areas to find, and you can play the levels in your own way. Really, I would have loved to have seen more FPS games use this sort of playstyle, as it is very satisfying to blaze your own path to an objective. The graphics for the game still look good after 10 goddamn years. The weapons are highly detailed, and even the 1911A1 has writing on its slide. The facial animations leave a little to be desired, but still hold up well. And the texture work also holds up pretty good. And sure, the game does not look like something from 2017, but it still looks halfway decent nonetheless. Now this is thankfully one of those games that fully embraces ragdoll physics. You know the kind. The kind where enemies get launched into the air when you shoot them. Since this game is more of a game than a documentary, you don't have to feel bad about cheering when you literally blow an enemy troop over the ledge of a building. The music for the game is excellent and gets the blood pumping for more action. Just have a listen. On the subject of music, this game also features one of the most nostalgic tracks in all of Medal of Honor. There is some voice acting in the game, and it's fairly good, but none of the performances stand out, but at least they are all consistent. Hey, Worth, go tell the CO we got this one. Sir, Sergeant Sensor's requesting reinforcements ASAP! Christ! We're spread thin as it is. Okay, you and Travers go, I'll hold here. I can't stand Sensor anyway. So now, let's take a look at the story. The game keeps its story to a minimum, and the game itself is based more on historical fiction than reality. And really, the story is just World War II. Each mission starts up with a cool little briefing that will show you the player what must be done in the coming mission. You play the character of Boyd Travers, although he's not really a character, and like in Doom, he is supposed to be you, which works well enough since this is a gameplay game and not a story-heavy one, although I still prefer my protagonist to have a voice. 
Each mission is supposed to be a battle from the Second World War, but many of these missions either never happened or they didn't happen like this. But really, the game isn't altogether that concerned with historical accuracy as it is about fun. And each level ramps up the difficulty considerably, and the levels get more and more complex, and the stakes get higher and higher. The game does not really feature any characters in the game as such, and there are no story arcs other than just World War II. Once again, this works for what they were going for, and the game does not really suffer for lack of a concrete story. One final thing to note is the fact that all of the AI bots seem to know that Boyd is the one really doing the fighting, as they will sometimes say, HERE COMES TRAVERS! I just love that the characters actually know that you're the one doing all the bloody work, and I get the feeling that Boyd is somehow related to BJ Blazkowicz, as they both fight off armies of enemies single-handedly. Now, if only there was a crossover where they teamed up to fight zombie Hitler, or at the very least his evil son, Hitler! Note, Hitler is actually a Bollywood film about the son of Hitler. Yes, that actually exists. The game is focused only on gameplay. There are hardly any cutscenes and a very, very few scripted sequences. So you are in control of your character for about 99% of the game. The game also never bogs down and never has any filler. The game also has a great deal of replayability as there are numerous weapon upgrades to unlock and numerous ways to complete the various levels. To be certain, I would have loved the game to have been longer than it is, but what it does in that six hours is nothing short of amazing. One last thing to mention is the last level. You get to assault a flat tower, aka a doom fortress. Yes, you assault a doom fortress, and it is glorious. Really, this one level should sell you the game right now. This is the best mission in the game, and it has absolutely nothing to do with history. In reality, the only flak towers that were ever assaulted were assaulted by Soviet troops, but you know what? This is fucking fun. Yes, this level is actually fuckworthy. Really, I want there to be more missions like this in other games. Just imagine something like this in a sci-fi game. And remember, this is not scripted at all. Your plane gets shot up, and then you jump out, and then you fight through the entire Black Tower. And you can land anywhere you want on it. Or you can literally just avoid the top of the tower and parachute all the way to the ground. When I first played this, I was in modern gaming mode and just assumed I had to land on the roof. I thought if I missed the roof, I would insta-die. But in this game, you do not. Overall, it was a game that reminded me of why I love FPS games in general. And it reminded me of why I love Medal of Honor. And it reminded me of just how inventive developers used to be. If that wasn't awesome enough, the game is cheap, too. On Steam, it can be had for a grand total of $10. That's half the price of Call of Duty 2. Ultimately, this is one of the best first-person shooters in general, and it's my second favorite World War II shooter of all time, second only to Medal of Honor Allied Assault. And so I am, of course, General Lutz, and I'm going to wish you good Medal of Honor Rising Sun and good Medal of Honor Frontline, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Medal of Honor Airborne, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you these awesome game reviews.